Well, welcome to this week's Monument Monday. And this week we're in Coolbeg, which is a townland just outside Drumcliff in North Sligo. And we're here to see this uh, wedge tomb. And I'm joined by Leo Layden, who is a local farmer and member of the Sligo Field Club. And Leo's going to give us a tour of this monument today. Um, I suppose we'll start by discussing what a wedge tomb is, Leo. Um, can you tell us when did these start to be built? Wedge tombs started to be built, or the, the last of the great stone monuments started to be built in Ireland. They started to be built about four and a half thousand years ago, and for about 500 years they continued to be built. They're by far the most popular Stone Age monument we have, and they have a distribution mostly along the west coast of Ireland and the northwest, but predominantly around. County Kerry, Cork, County Clear, and then you have another cluster here in Sligo stretching into the into Ulster. They're usually they're called a Bronze Age or from the Copper Age burial, and that started in Ireland about four and a half thousand years ago. And some people say that during excavations, some copper and some bronze has been found in the, in it, and pottery associated with that period, and also burned bone and in a couple of cases that have been excavated there, were, there was unburned bone but mostly it's the tradition of burned bone. There's sometimes found on routeways in a lot of cases or at fording points and here we are right on the banks of the Drumcliff River. It's only literally about 20 metres away and in the background you can hear the car still to this day because between the river and the mountain, there's only about two miles. It's quite a narrow gap, and it was, it's still the roadway between north south part of Ireland. And it, it, in prehistory, it's it was similar. Wedge tombs vary in size. This one is a very good example. The best examples are probably found down around Cork, Kerry, area, and County Clare. But this is a very good example, and it's quite big, in the terms of, of wedge tombs in the sense that it's about nine metres long and it's about three and a half metres wide. They're quite distinctive in the sense that they're called wedge tombs because from the front which we are here now these are the two orthostats and this would have been the entrance. This was the capstone that was across here. This is about a metre high. They're called wedge tombs because the taper to get narrow from the front to the back, width-wise and also height-wise, that they taper down as you come near the back. This one also has a parallel line of stones. One of them is the re revetment. Um, and that was the the tomb itself would have been surrounded by a, a, a cairn of small stones and uh, this revetment would have held it all together. So these are the, the curb stones that we see. There's traces of them here on those uprights. Leo. Yeah, the, these. and as we go around the tomb, they're more distinctive at yeah. the back. In a couple of excavations, it's found that this, sometimes the outer curb was built quite a, a, number, a couple of hundred years after the, the inner, but in this case we don't know. It's probably parallel, mm -hmm. They're probably constructed around the same time. And this tomb has never been excavated? This tomb hasn't been excavated. Yeah. But in, the 18, in 1880, Wood Martin, who was a local renowned antiquarian from County Sligo and Wakeman came here and drew it and it hasn't really changed much. There was a number, quite a number more of, of capstones on it but it hasn't really changed much. So these are these roof stones here, these really large yeah. uh, slabs. So as you can see, when you look at it from back to the front, it sort of rises towards the front. Yeah, yeah, I can see that wedge shape. So it's much higher at this end, which is the western end. And if we cross in here, we can, eastern. if we go through the tomb, there's a couple of other features about wedge tombs that makes them very distinctive from the other tombs and the more we, we have passage tombs, we have core tombs and we have portal tombs in Ireland and these wedge tombs come, they start to be built about 500 years after 
the, the other group that I mentioned ceased to be constructed. So there was a, about a 500 year gap, but that didn't mean that people in Ireland weren't building some sort of monuments. We have, uh, we have hinges, we have barrows, we have maybe wooden structures that have now disappeared. So they were probably carrying out some ritual. We don't know really what their function was, whether there was ritual going on or whether it were basically for funerary. But one very distinctive feature about wedge tombs compared to the other tombs is that they face west and that's faced towards the setting sun. Yeah. Whereas the other group of tombs all face due east, face towards the rising sun. And some people say that maybe it's faced on the sun of Samhain that has the, the beginning of winter. As the sun goes down in the west, that the tomb faced it. But this one definitely is facing west as well, and most of the wedge tombs do, whereas most of the other group of tombs face towards the rising sun. So was any of this, at some point, this would have been covered in a cairn. Um, would these stone curbs have been visible? The outside of these stone curbs were visible. You can, they're quite distinctive here on this side. You may have a cairn of stones coming down to the top of it and, and covering the, the capstones and going out to the, in the, the edge of the curbs on the other side. Yeah, and you can see, um, as we take a little look, these are the curbstones um, set on their side and these would have held in the, a stone cairn. Yeah. And there's traces of the cairn Probably in underneath the certain underneath mount the, here, the, yeah. The, the frontier. And we're back around to the front. You have the these arter stats, there's upright stones here as well, holding in the curb. The one, there are two on this side. These would have been quite well, very well built of its time. Some of the examples you have down the south, they're quite well built and quite regular. And, and as they go back into this wedge shape, you have a distinctive U shape at the back as well. It's not quite sharp. It's a, they have a distinctive U shape built as well. And an interesting feature here too is that this area, of course, Ben Baldwin is predominantly limestone, but yet this tomb is built from sandstone. It's not built from limestone, but we don't know the reasons for these variations. And can you tell me how many chambers or burial chambers would a wedge tomb normally have? In most of them, it's only one large chamber, but in a, a, a few in the south part of Ireland, you have two chambers. So it may have originated as, as one chamber that was divided after. Uh -huh. And this one may have had one, possibly two. Yes. We don't know yeah. because we don't have the full arrangement still here. And some of these stones have slipped and moved. And of course, you can see where the trees are growing as well. This one is very distinct, isn't it? Just growing through this, it is, this yeah. gap. Sort of like a, it's, it's a hawthorn, yeah, a it's sacred a, tree, one of the sacred trees of Ireland. It's really taken root there. And another little distinctive feature here in the tomb, just before yeah, we, we'll we leave it, we'll is back here. Wakeman refers to cup and ring marks on it, but it's on the north side of the tomb, but whether the stone that he's seen them on is missing now, but you have a very distinctive stone here at the, at the north end of it. Or, is this bull on stone? And you've still have people visit today, you have these little bull -uns. Some of them are natural. This stone may have started out as with natural erosion under a tree and yeah. for hunt under different trees that grew for hundreds of years and naturally eroded. But some of them, these holes have definitely been enhanced and that they're, they're very fine and regular. And you do get these throughout Ireland surviving at some fording points in rivers. And a couple of people have hypothesized that sometimes for safe passage or safe crossing of a river that people place stones in them and turn them in certain directions but we don't know but what's well, a really interesting extra feature here and we've had a look on at some of the curb stones as well Leo and there are markings on them but it's really hard to tell whether they're natural or man-made yeah, exactly. because of the sandstone and too this sandstone right beside yeah. us here has that but 
you have a very defined these hollows uh, yeah hollows here and and they're as if they're enhanced by stones turning them and that could is it possible that this stone was once part of the um monument it's possible that may have been one of the capstones but we 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 would know if it was possibly excavated whether it's in situ whether it's there all the time but until it's excavated if ever yeah we'll possibly never know but that's that's the interesting part about all these monuments that it's not the story never ends the story continues about them yeah yeah and it's it's really um lovely to see this very well preserved monument leo and thank you for showing us around um and just to give you another quick look back over it. So thank you very much. You're very welcome.